I never know what I'm going to talk about either till I get done. Uh, but what I thought I'd try to talk about is uh, uh, every animal we use is selected. Whether you did it, nature did it, one way or another, they're selected. And but what we need to do is thinking about selecting the animals for the job we want to get done. Pretty good feedback between the behavior and the manager. Uh, the manager definitely determines the genetics out there, the, the species, the breed, and these sort of things. And the feedback is, if the animals that he chose to put out there are not performing to his expectation, they get called. And so the, the uh, performance of those animals, again, feed back to that manager. Finally, and we've heard this a lot already, we know genetics has a big effect on behavior. Uh, and behavior has probably some effect on genetics. We'll talk about that, but uh, at least in grazing animals, that's not very well established at this point. So when we manage, uh, there's only four decisions we have to make. And so for most college graduates, you might be able to keep up with four. Uh, there's where and how many we graze. There's what time of year, when do we graze them? And the species, or we could say the breeds within species, uh, those all affect what the animals eat and stuff. And I'm not really going to talk about learned behavior very much. I will some, but I just want to recognize up front that uh, you know there is learning. They can be taught, um, but uh, really I want to talk about the genetics. So this is kind of what got me going on. Animals could be selected for the way that, uh, uh, what they graze, diet selection. Whether you realize it or not, in the classical ecological sense, these, uh, these dogs are foraging on those cows, okay? And one is foraging on the heels and the other is foraging on the head. And if you've ever worked with stock dogs, you know that when you tell a heel dog to sick them, it's gonna go for the heels. And when you tell a head dog to sick him, he's going to go for the head. Now, you can train a head dog to do a little healing, but I'll be damned if I've ever taught a heel dog to head. So uh, it is pretty strongly innately, you know, that's innate behaviors. So what I want to do is just go back through some literature. Most of it's mine. Uh, it's not that it's the best literature, but it's the only stuff I ever read. And so... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so, uh, and kind of put together some of the things that we've learned over the last 20 years or so. So first off, nature versus nurture. One of the early studies we did was to look at the exposure of lambs to leafy spurge and how did that affect their diet, okay? And uh, we found about a 10 percentage unit difference that the exposed lambs and this was over uh, a few months' time. It wasn't a short-term pen study. This was out on pasture. Uh, and so, yes, there was a difference. It wasn't, a, you know, real great, but there was a difference there. And this is actually one of my more cited studies. I think it's because it was titled How to Train Lambs to Be Weed Eaters, and people thought that was catchy. And if they believed in training, why, they always cited that, right? Then uh, we did this study and we said, well, let's compare sheep to goats. Now there's a big difference. We, the, the sheep were still eating about the same as these exposed ones, 20%. The goats were eating over 60%. That's a genetic difference. And it's three times as big as basically the learned difference. And I thought that was pretty important. Um, and just so you know, when we did that study, uh, the the sheep the the wool growers were really mad at us because it was like they thought they had the market cornered on grazing spurge you know and uh, they just they wanted us to do it over till we got it right but we didn't um, and so why is that well we did a study and uh, I got to tell you a little story on this one notice that's a 2007 study we and this is going to be related to other things later in the talk but. We tried, what we basically did is we wanted to know if spurge was aversive to sheep and not goats. 
And so basically what we did is we fed them a novel feed, some corn for 30 minutes the first day, for three days basically. After the first day, we uh, gavaged them with either crested wheatgrass or leafy spurge. And when we dosed the, the sheep with the uh, crested wheatgrass, actually for the next two, at the average over the next two days, they doubled their intake of that novel feed. Uh, when we dosed them with the leafy spurge, uh, they cut their intake to 20% of what they had that first day. Goats were kind of the opposite. They stayed the same with crested wheatgrass, had no real effect, but they again nearly doubled the intake when given leafy spurge. So clearly, spurge was aversive to sheep, but not to the goats. And then the reason I point this date out is we tried to make an argument in the ecological literature that uh, this ability to detoxify things was a very important factor in uh, niche separation of St. Patrick herbivores. But when, when sheep herders try to publish in the ecological literature, they don't get much respect, and we never could find anybody. We couldn't find, like, uh, ecologia in, in journals like that where we really wanted to go with it. They wouldn't take it. So anyway, and I'm going to be talking about uh, invisible colleges in a little bit, so that's the relation there. Well, then we wanted to know, well, is it possible that it's getting detoxified in the rumen? So we took spurge and we fermented it in uh, either goat digesta, rumen fluid, or uh, sheep rumen fluid. And we took sheep and we did an aversion trial again where this shows the uh, novel food consumption over several days and we dosed them here. And so what you can see is when we dosed the sheep with leafy spurge fermented for 24 hours in goat digesta, it did not avert the sheep. He continued to eat the same amount. But when it was done in the sheep digesta, the intake declined. And so we said, hey, it looks like uh, this may be rumen microflora mediated uh, effect on the animal's uh, uh, consumption. So let's just review, because I know that uh, you've got short memories. Uh, experience with leafy spurge by young sheep results in a small increase in consumption, but using goats compared to sheep causes a large increase uh, in spurge consumption. So that's a, a genetic versus behavioral difference. Um, and why? Because leafy spurge causes the learned taste aversion in sheep, and the aversion can be attenuated by fermenting in goat digesta, okay? Well, now I want to talk a little bit about the genetic environmental interaction. We did another study where we had uh, some goats raised on nannies. We cross-fostered some lambs onto some goats. And then we had lambs raised by the ewe, okay? And they all grazed uh, together in the same leafy spurge infested pasture. And what did we find? Well. We found about the same thing that we had previously. Goats were eating more than 60% of their diet in spurge. Uh, in this case, the, the ewe reared ones, even though they were experienced, was down to 10%, but it's still in the range of what we were seeing. But the goat reared ones, uh, the goat reared lambs, were eating over 30% of their diet uh, in spurge, bigger than we had seen previously. So what was the cause of that? Um, and there's potentially several, I think. One, it, it may be just a learned behavior. If the ewe's not eating the, the target species, then potentially she's teaching her offspring not to eat the target species. It's more than just being exposed to it. it they have to see a model eating it. But there are some potential genetic effects, too. One could be uh, the metagenomic effect. In other words, room and microflora uh, when a lamb is first born, or any rumen that's first born, do they have a rumen uh, microbial uh, population? They don't. Where do they get it from? Their mother, pretty much, okay? Uh, she licks it, and she's been regurgitating, and you know, they introduce that to that animal. So maybe it was uh, a, gene a you know, metagen metagenomic effect. However, it could have been another a genetic effect, maybe, 
Sheep just aren't as smart as goats, right? And then maybe it was a physiological, but again, a genetic, physiologically, the ability of, say, a hepatic de detoxification, these sort of things. Uh, at any rate, um, you know, there, there's various explanations. Well, I want to talk about a study we've been working on now for a number of years, uh, selecting goats for juniper consumption. We have two flocks, uh, each with divergent selection. We have a group of meat goats that we've selected. Uh, we have a line for high consumption of juniper and a line for low consumption. We also have a flock of angora goats. Same thing, a high consumption line, low consumption line. Um, do this with classic uh, animal breeding techniques, the calculating expected breeding values, selecting sires and dams. Um, we determine the amount of juniper in the diet using uh, fecal, uh, fecal uh, near-infrared spectroscopy to predict that, or to, to get the phenotypic data. So this shows you what's been happening over time. Now, these are the top 10% and the bottom 10%. Okay, if we go to the middle, we don't see this kind of diversion, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see the change in the expected breeding value of these meat goats over time. Uh, so we've gone from basically zero up to uh, a little over 7% units above for the uh, hide line in the meat goats and about the same distance uh, on, the, uh, on the low line. We haven't seen as much difference in the angora goats, probably two reasons. One. It's hard to raise Angora kids, so our reproduction rate is lower and our selection pressure is lower. And two, the uh, Angoras have been selected uh, for a, a, a long time, and so they, they may not be, have the heterogeneity in their genotype that the, uh, that the meat goats have. If we just look at this same data and we just plot the differences uh, between the high and the low lines, again, this is the top 10% in the bottom 10%. You can see since 2005, we've uh, gone to basically uh, 14 percentage unit differences in the expected breeding value uh, of, of the meat goats and uh, about eight, nine percentage units in the uh, angora goats. The encouraging thing is we see the same thing in two different experiments, two different breeds of goats. So why is that? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons and we're we continue to investigate that, but this is one that we have found. What we did in this study is we, uh, we gave an interruminal dose of monoterpenes to uh, low consuming goats, to low consuming goats and high consuming goats. In other words, we gave them what we thought would be kind of a, a, a daily consumption of monoterpenes, and then we monitored it the uh, plasma concentration of the monoterpene, this is uh, camphor, in the blood. And what you see is that these, low, these goats, the low-consuming goats, they have this big peak of monoterpenes of camphor in the blood. And Rachel worked on this. She probably knows more about it than, than I do. But at any rate, long story short, they were exposed to a big dose of monoterpenes, which we think is at least one of the anti-quality uh, phytochemicals that limit consumption of juniper. The high consuming goats didn't see that peak and so physiologically whether it was hepatic, could have been even ruminal, they didn't get exposed to the toxins that the big ones did. So that, so one way or another, uh, you know, there is a, we can explain some of that difference. This is uh, something really interesting, and I don't even know if I understand it, but I'm going to throw it out there and maybe somebody here does. Again, okay, so what we did is I took the top 10% and the bottom 10% and looked at their either expected breeding value or the phenotypic expression of that. So what we see is, again, I showed you before about a 14 percentage unit difference in that expected breeding value. But look at the difference in the phenotypic expression. They're actually eating, the difference is 25 percentage units, you know? Um, you know, almost twice as big. 
as we go down, uh, this would be like the 80 to 90 percentile minus the 10 to 20 percentile. So difference in expected breeding value is, is lower as it should be. And the increase in the phenotypic expression, again, is not as great as it was until you get down here to the bottom where it's actually the phenotypic expression is lower than the uh, genetic potential, the difference in the genetic potential. So down here, we're looking at the bottom 10% of the high consumers and the top 10% of the low consumers, okay? And so uh, the difference in the genetic potential is less than five units and it's actually negative here. Part of that is explained simply that that expected breeding value includes information from their pedigree. So they had offspring or uh, grandsires or sires or, you know, grand dams, these sort of things that were high consumers that contributed to that expected breeding value. But I just, I don't, again, I'm not sure what it means. Does, is that a learned part of the, you know, of the equation? Maybe it is. Uh, and we see the same thing with the Angoras. So if you review the literature uh, and look at uh, different places where the uh, heritability has been estimated, uh, you find various values. These were some predatory mites, and I just threw that in. This was actually meal size. They selected for a low meal size or a high meal size. They calculated heritability on the two different lines. And you can see it was uh, 45 percent for one and uh, 25 for the other. I put this red line, which is heritability of weaning weights in cattle, uh, and I put that in there to show you, okay, this relative to something that we have done a lot of selection on and made a lot of genetic progress on, this is the kind of heritabilities that have been calculated for diet selection. Uh, on the goats, for browse, this was an early study uh, done uh, at San Angelo using microhistological techniques and they calculated for browse plants that were avoided the uh, the heritability was in the 30 percent range we did one on juniper um, using micro or using near infrared uh, and it was quite a bit lower uh, there's some reasons for that probably which had to do with sampling we had a uh, uh, a very low repeatability on that. So there's a lot of, of uh, animal or within animal variation. Uh, a study that I worked on in uh, Idaho on sagebrush showed the heritability for sagebrush and sheep to be about uh, 28, 27 percent. This study was done in New Mexico by Winder and low numbers. One of the problems with this is when you calculate the confidence intervals on most of these heritabilities, uh, it includes both 100 and 0. So uh, even though that was the estimated heritability, there was a lot of, uh, the, with not tight confidence intervals on that. But nonetheless, what I would argue is for diet selection, um, the heritability appears to be in the 30% range is what I kind of like. You know, that's uh, what I think. And, and again, this just shows for uh, Angus yearling weights, uh, heritability 0.45, that over time the increase in uh, uh, yearling weight has been about 1% a year, selecting for something that has about a 45% heritability. There's more to it than just heritability. There's also how much variation is there in that trait. But clearly, nobody would argue you shouldn't select for yearling weight if that's important to you. And I would argue that we should be able to make similar progress with things like diet selection or even uh, uh, the distribution and other grazing behaviors. We already have several identified uh, uh, microflora that detoxify various compounds in the rumen. The Australians have made a genetically modified uh, uh, bacteria that will uh, denature uh, sodium fluoroacetate, which is a toxic compound in a lot of tropical areas, uh, particularly in South Africa and Australia. So they're actually working on 
making uh, a rumen microbe that will detoxify that. One of the first ones that we found was uh, this Synergistes jonesii. Jones wrote that first paper, if you'll remember, on Lucana where they found the goats in uh, Hawaii that could eat Lucana and they didn't die from it, okay? And so they can, so this bacteria can uh, detoxify the uh, mimosine in uh, Lucana. And uh, the purely, Pyrrolicidine alkaloids that are in uh, tansy ragwort, they have found ovine rumen bacteria. It hadn't actually been exactly identified which one, but we do know that, that sheep rumen bacteria can detoxify that. Interestingly on that one, what they also found out was cattle had the same, some, you know, some of the same bacteria, but they were orders of magnitude lower in their concentration. So that rumen environment uh, is not is is also influenced by the animal that that's carrying it around and, and kind of uh, related to that. So when we found out that if we fermented spurge in goat uh, digesta, it wasn't toxic or it didn't avert sheep anymore. We tried to inoculate sheep with uh, with goat rumen fluid, and we did several different things. But long story short, we were never successful in changing that animal's microflora. Uh, and I, my assumption is it's simply because a goat rumen is not a sheep rumen and vice versa, and whatever it took to do that could not sustain itself in the sheep. The Australians are actually shipping around uh, this uh, Synergistus jones jonesii, uh, and so people can inoculate animals that are gonna go on to the cana pastures. Well, the other one is the epigenetics. And uh, basically, we know that maternal care and uh, tactical stimulation has an effect on the methylation of, of, the, of genes. And so a methylated gene has been silenced. It's not being expressed. And so I was loved by my mother, and she held me, and I became a pretty good guy. But my crazy brother, who was ugly from the beginning, you know, and didn't get held much, why uh, he got, must have gotten methylated. And uh, so we know, and, and this has been shown that, uh, that uh, this maternal care has an effect, a, an ongoing in, uh, effect, and it causes uh, increased rates of uh, schizophrenia, drug abuse, diabetes, a lot of things. And, and that's a genetic effect, something that uh, I certainly don't know much about, and I think we're just beginning to learn about, and it could actually be part of the experienced behavioral thing in diet selection or uh, grazing distribution. So let's review again, because I'm sure you forgot where we, what we went over. Uh, diet selection is a heritable trait. Uh, genetic progress in changing this trait can be made by selective breeding. Uh, differences in expected breeding value for diet selection has a physiological basis. Uh, metagenomics, the rumen microflora may cause that difference. Or epigenetics, the effect of the environment on gene expression may also affect uh, the diet selection. Well, I want to talk a little bit about dogs because I probably know about more about them from a practical perspective anyway. And this is a really good book uh, by Coppingers. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they did all the guard dog, early guard dog research, and they've just done amazing research on dogs. But they were talking about this uh, Brian Plummer. Brian Plummer has passed away, but he was a trainer in the UK and had a television show and all that. And I just want to read you something out of this book about genetics and behavior. Remember the story in chapter four about Brian Plummer in Scotland who built his dog training career on the fact that he can teach any breed any task. Brian believes that nurture is more important than nature in determining intelligence. I spent a delightful day hunting rabbits with Brian and his King Charles Spaniels. Why did you pick this breed, I said because these dogs have been the epitome of the housebound, non-working pet dog for centuries, said he. If I can train them to hunt rabbits, I can make my point. 
I can train any breed to do anything. And sure enough, after scampering over hill and dale, uh, holding the rabbit and driving it out with a ferret, the King Charles Spaniels killed it. When we went down to the river and put his golden retriever through fetch, retrieve, and deliver to hand routines, uh, which she would work at all day long, I asked Brian if he could train his golden retriever to herd sheep, and he responded instantly, no problem, it would be easy to train a golden to herd sheep. Then I asked, could you then take that dog into a sheepdog trial and win? Oh no, he said, without hesitation, I knew I was ta I, then I knew I was talking with a person who understands behavioral confirmation. The reason he cannot teach the golden to win a sheep trial is the same reason I cannot teach a dachshund to win a sled dog race. By the way, he's also a musher. Uh, they, were the, they are the wrong shape, the wrong conformation. The dachshund has the wrong physical conformation, and the golden has the wrong behavioral conformation to herd sheep. A Chesapeake Bay Retriever, a Border Collie, and an English Pointer all have breeding-specific behavioral conformation that predisposes them to be able to learn their specific task and perform that task better than any other breed. The performance has nothing to do with intelligence, but rather with the shape of the behavior that we have to learn as dog ethologists to give up they aren't smart vocabulary and look at innate behavioral differences. So uh, the point is, uh, the genetics are going to have a big influence on the expression of the behavior. And so I asked the question, you know, can you fool Mother Nature? Because sometimes when we talk about training, we get the idea that animals can overcome their physiological and their genetic limitations to eat things. So just a little bit more of some data that we did to show that animals do learn, but sometimes they learn that they don't want to eat this stuff, right? Because uh, mostly what we hear about is you can teach them to eat something that you didn't think they'd eat. But in this case, we had uh, leafy spurge from Idaho, which is very aversive, and leafy spurge from North Dakota, which is uh, not really aversive. And we had sheep from Idaho and uh, uh, North Dakota. And if you've ever heard Garrison Keeler talk about those uh, Norwegian bachelor farmers, you know those North Dakota sheep aren't very smart. Uh, anyway, so we put them out on pasture, and uh, this is preference index. And at the beginning, uh, the Idaho sheep immediately avoided the spurge because they knew Idaho spurge wasn't good, right? And initially, the Dakota sheep ate it because they were experienced with spurge that they didn't get ne negative feedback. But about two days later when we measured it, they were both avoiding it. So it didn't take them long to figure out that this isn't what they really want to eat. When we, then we took them all up uh, to North Dakota, and basically they ate it. There was no preference. It was eaten relative to its availability, showing that both groups of sheep understood that this plant was okay. It wasn't great, but it was, it was okay. Um, and uh, similar thing, only with naive sheep, those previous ones uh, were not naive, uh, but both groups, uh, they would eat the North Dakota hay and very little intake on the, uh, on the Idaho hay. Uh, if you look over time, you know, it actually increased the second day, so they're learning, you know, after the first day that, yeah, this is okay stuff, but here they learned it wasn't that good and they decreased it. So, so animals do learn. Uh, but, they, but there are limits to what they can eat because if they get negative feedback, they're just not going to eat it. Um, this is a study we did with some colleagues in um, uh, Israel, and they were uh, trying to get, they were trying to look at uh, exposure and things uh, by goats on uh, Pistazia uh, lenticus, which is a shrub that is very high in tannins. It runs 15 to 25 percent tannins. And interestingly, basically when they were naive, all the goats ate about the same amount of this shrub. This was in a pen situation. They had cross-fostered uh, 
mamber goats on Tama Damascus goats and Damascus goats on mamber goats. And uh, this is the breed of the dam. And then they had these bottle-fed goats that didn't have a role model. And this is what's really interesting. The goats, whether they were Damascus or Mamber, that were raised on these Mamber dams, they never increased their intake of this Potassia. Uh, and so basically, you'd say the dam showed them not to eat it. The ones that had no role models, they increased it after some experience. And the ones raised on the Damascus goats eat, ate even more after that experience. So if you were here earlier, you know I just can't help but to quote a song or two and uh, made me think of Graham Nash's song uh, that you might have heard if you're an old hippie like me. And you of tender years can't know the fears that your elders grew by. And so please help them with your youth. They seek the truth before they can die. So in other words, if mama's teaching that, that uh, mamber kid, don't eat this stuff, it might kill you. So here was a fairly recent article in Applied Animal Behavior Science uh, called Individual Individualistic Herds, um, Individual Variation in Herbivore Foraging Behavior. And they gave this model about uh, why animals eat what they eat. And I'm not going to go into it because I don't really have time. But they admit, you know, there's an inheritance, the morphology, the physiology. That's kind of what Karen was talking about. Then experience, uh, I don't know what extra genetic inheritance is, but uh, I don't think I believe in it, frankly. Anyway, it affects the behavior. And of course, the environment affects it. They have these consequences, and it feeds back to the experience. Well, I would argue that they missed a critical loop here. And that is the inheritance affects what that feedback is, you know? Uh, yes, they learn. But it's modified through that, and that's a big controller of what ultimately happens. So by now, I'm sure you're convinced that, uh, that genetics are much more important than learning. But the question I have is, why has learning received so much more attention than genetics? And I have some suggestions. That's one of them. Uh, you know, if you're a dynamic speaker and you're really smart and you write a lot, uh, people start believing you, right? And uh, certainly Fred has done that. Uh, what Fred may not know that hypergraphia, do you all know what hypergraphia is? It's people that compulsively write. And uh, it's associated, it's, there's not, they haven't identified a gene for it, but it is associated with, with temporal lobe epilepsy which is known to run in families. So I think it's a genetic thing here. Uh, but what is the reason for the lack of uh, interest in the genetics of foraging behavior? Well, one, I would argue, is the Matthew effect. And uh, Matthew 25, 29 says, for unto, every, for unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall be, have in abundance. But from him that hath not, shall be taken away even that which he hath. And, and actually, uh, there is literature on this beyond the Bible. Um, in the sociology of science, the Matthew effect was a term coined by Robert Merton to describe how, among other things, eminent scientists will often get more credit than, is comparatively, than a comparatively unknown researcher, even if their work is similar. It also means that the credit will usually be given to researchers who, have are, who are already famous. For example, a prize will almost always be awarded to the most senior researcher involved in a project, even if all the work has, was done by a graduate student. So this, that's one explanation, right? The Matthew effect. Learning's fast. So you can, uh, and it's entertaining, you know? You, you go out there and teach a dog to roll over, or you do a, uh, an aversion trial for you know, a demonstration. People see it, it's fast and it's fun, right? Uh, and several studies can be completed in a graduate program doing learning stuff. How many graduate students does it take to get one paper on a, on a breeding project, you know? I remember Keith Erkenbrack at the sheep station. He figured one manuscript every decade was pretty good output, you know? But, but they were good papers. Um, 
And then there's a belief at least, uh, particularly among practitioners of targeted grazing, uh, that, they can, that there's no economic value because they can train their animals to do, uh, you know, they can get as much out of training as they can get by buying an animal that's been selected for whatever behavioral trait related to foraging that, that you might be selling that animal for. Um, so I do want to talk about uh, who remembers Dick Hart? We haven't seen him in a while. He's a great guy, right? And uh, we, unfortunately, he hasn't been here in a while, but I, he wrote a paper in Journal Range Management called Invisible Colleges. And the term invisible college symbolizes divisions within science or within a field of science. They are communications networks linking non-intersecting subgroups, each containing a few very productive scientists and many, I should say very many, less productive ones. They provide uh, loose but effective communications networks within a team of students and junior colleagues headed by a productive researcher. Uh, so I think we do develop these invisible colleges relative to what's important, behavior uh, or genetics and these sort of things. This is one of the uh, first papers we did on selection and this is just the, uh, the citations of it. And if you look in there, you don't see very many people citing this work and that are really into the learned stuff, and the ones that do don't really understand what they're citing, in my opinion, which, as you know, is right. Uh, so back to this individual, and this is a good example of that, okay? I want to read you a little bit out of this paper relative to inheritance. Specifically, we focus on opportunities uh, for exploiting individual uh, variation in foraging behavior of livestock to improve management of rangelands, a concept that is often voiced in management circles, Bailey et al., 1998, Launch Ball and Howery, 2005, Provenza et al., 2003, but has yet to engender widespread acceptance and use in management. However, the heritability of diet selection will need to be assessed on a per livestock species, per plant species basis. For instance, Ellis, 2005, failed to find a highly heritable component of juniper consumption in goat, and Frost, <laughs> and Frost et al., 2003, failed to find any significant uh, heritable component to consumption of bitterweed by sheep. A broader, at broader scales, there is some evidence that terrain use of cattle in mountainous rangeland may have a heritable component, Bailey et al., 2004. Okay, so I would argue, though, many times what you discover is how you view the world and how you do the experiment, okay? And so if you're looking for behavioral things, those experiences, those experiments usually are fairly short-term you know, a week or so, maybe uh, two weeks of a, in a pen trial. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, and I just, real briefly, we did a study. We followed, we looked at uh, juniper consumption in goats for two years, sampled them twice a week, fecal samples twice a week uh, for two years. And actually every other day for a little while in February one year. And uh, so that just shows you the large amount of variation. And that's all 12 goats. And the point is, when we started this experiment, we had six goats that were kind of from the top end. We just started our research, so there wasn't that separation that you saw earlier on in this talk. But we took uh, half the goats out of the top quartile, half the goats out of the bottom quartile, based on three measurements that we had previously made over about a year period. And long story short, Two of the goats swapped quartiles over that two-year period in their overall juniper consumption. Uh, the difference initially was 18 percentage units, and it dropped to eight. And the, uh, the um, uh, correlation was about uh, 0.18 between that initial ranking and over the two years. So a lot of variation goes on, and you need to account for that. Well, who trains who in the first place? 
Are we training these lambs or did they teach us to come out there every morning, pour them some feed, check the water, clean the trough, that sort of thing, huh? I wonder who's really training who. And the dumber you get, the better you are at it because this corn plant, this man's out hoeing the weeds. We, you know, we, we plant this, we irrigate it, we fertilize it. And we, if you're talking about an evolutionary strategy, corn is a huge winner, right? Because it went from some, you know, little old grass uh, in the new world to one of the predominant plant species on the planet. And did it do it on its own? No. It had a companion animal that took care of it, right? So again, if we're worried about training, you just better be sure whether you're the trainor or the trainee. Well, Derek, there are real hill climbing cows in Switzerland. Now they have selected those cows so that the legs on one side are shorter than on the other side, you know. But there are limits to what you can do because compared to, those guys are pikers. And so that's a real genetic difference, right? And I don't know all the answers, but I'm beginning to ask the right questions. So thank you. Yes. Uh, 